Hi, everyone. Tonight, it's my great pleasure to have with me Professor Catherine Liu from the Department of Film and Media Studies in the School of Humanities here at UCI. Welcome, Catherine. <laughs> Good to see you. So, Catherine, what are you going to cook for us tonight? Um, so, I'm going to make two dishes. I prepped one already. One is, um, that one is a rib, spare rib soup, one of my grandmother's recipes. And then what I'm going to cook right now and saute live for you guys is um, green pea tofu beef and saute. And then we're going to have that over rice. And this is a very, um, very uh, comforting dish. And it's also really great when you want to have lots of protein, you want your, your greens, your roughage and everything in one, um, in, in one dish. One bowl. Um, it's not very sophisticated Chinese food, but it's really comforting food and it nourishes you. And my son loved this dish. And I love this dish as a graduate student because it was super cheap, super easy to make, but very Chinese. Good. The other thing is that um, it, I'm going, the, the oil is heating up now. So I'm going to start. And I have, I've used uh, canola oil and mm -hmm. I'm going to mm -hmm. add as it will get hot, the um, garlic. And so the garlic now is um, heating up. And my next step is that I'm going to add the beef, ground beef, which I've already um, marinated in soy sauce. And the thing that I was going to say was, this is a Chinese dish that you can make when you live in an area with no Chinese Chinese dish you can make when you live in an area, no Chinese grocery stores, and you're really um, jonesing for something Chinese, you can just have, you can always get organic firm tofu, you can always get ground beef, and you can always get frozen peas. And if you, you know, if you want to be um, healthy, I got, I made um, this with organic beef, organic mm -hmm. tofu, and um, organic frozen peas. So now I've got this in a nice sort of soupy, brothy state, and mm -hmm. the beef is still not completely cooked yet. So I'm going to finish it with the peas. And what I was going to say too is that one of these, this is a dish that is not spicy. So if you like Chinese food, but you don't want spicy, this is delicious to have. And it's more Cantonese. I, all my food, Annalisa, is about, all the food that I cook that's Chinese is about memories. And one of the really great memories I have about eating this dish is going to Chinatown after Chinese school and getting green peas and beef over rice. And I had this dream that I was gonna live in New York City, eat green peas and beef over rice, and live in a tiny apartment and read books. And that was going to be the, my heaven. This is, what, this is what I thought my future would be as like when I was 11. And I, so of course it did, things didn't quite turn out that way, but I did go to graduate school in New York. And then um, of course um, it's getting cooked. It's, it's cooking now to a really nice texture because the peas are melting and creating this kind of nice um, uh, moisture in the dish. And so um, the tofu is gonna break up a little bit, but once you have, once you see that your beef is completely cooked, then you are done. So- Looks fabulous. 
So you, I, I've made my rice already, and I'm just going to have this over rice. And you should, and this is how I cook. I mean, I cook to taste. I salt to taste, so I'm going to taste it. Mm, it's good. But I'm going to add a little more soy sauce. And, and because in Palm Springs, there are no Chinese grocery stores, I couldn't get black bean sauce. So I'm just going to um, have use soy sauce and garlic as my major spices, which is fine. But if you go to Resh 99, you can get fermented black bean sauce. And that is delicious over mm -hmm. um, in this dish as well. Have you ever lived in uh, outside the U.S. in the, in the in your um, I lived in France. I lived in Germany a little bit. I lived in you know I was born in Taiwan. Uh, you were born in Taiwan. I there for a little bit. With um, I lived there in two thousand three, two thousand four, with my son when I had a Fulbright. The thing about being in Taiwan is there's so many good restaurants and there's and food and eating out is so cheap. Most Chinese moms are also really busy, so they don't cook that much. This is the secret. All right, I'm done because I see that my ground beef has cooked all the way through. I tasted it. And I think the salt is good. So now I'm going to turn it off. And I'm done. That was so easy. Great. That was so easy, but it looks yummy. It does look yummy, doesn't it? And it's super nourishing, too. And so I'm going to remove this from the cooker because, and I already have my rice. I'm going to serve this rice. But the thing about a Chinese meal, as everyone knows, is that you should have more than one dish. And I'm kind of lame. I only have this dish and you should always have a soup, especially mm -hmm. in the winter when it's cold. It's really nice to have a soup. So I'm going to bring in my soup today. So this is a dish that I often crave in wintertime, um, my grandmother's spare rib soup. Um, if you don't live in an area with a Chinese butcher like Red 99, you can go get a rack of ribs and cut them up, put them in about seven liters of water like I did. So three, so it's like three, um, oh, is that, so now I don't have to text. So it's like three pounds of ribs that I cut up. I put them in seven liters of water in this big Coke pot with some fresh ginger that I'm not going to serve and some vinegar, salt, and pepper to taste. The key to this making this really clear, delicious broth, because it's really chic now to talk about beef broth, is to take off the um, foam while you're yeah. cooking. That's like the most labor intensive part of this dish or maybe cutting things up. To make a really clear bone broth, the key is to take the foam off as you're slow cooking the meat. So I think that a lot of the El Bulli, the really famous um, chefs in Europe who started working with foam, actually just a lot of time making broths and taking off the foam. I remember, but I remember as a kid, like no famous chef doing this, I remember my grandmother just standing and taking the foam off the top of the slow cooked, um, be uh, this is a pork broth. So you get that really clear, wonderful soup as a product at the end. But this is, you know, this takes some time and then you get the, um, and then you have foam. I mean, I'm going to feed this to my dogs, but the foam I think is, um, creates an essence here. And I feel like it was an inspiration to a lot of cooks because I know, because I watch cooking shows that a lot of famous chefs end up like doing this thing and talking about how you take the foam off to create this clear broth. And it's very inspiring actually to create, to have this foam and to produce this beautiful clear broth because now you can see how beautiful the broth is going to be underneath it. But if you don't do it, then you have this kind of like um, murky soup at the end and the the more regularly you do this in cooking rib soup like this the more beautiful and clear your broth will be my grandmother was had a had to cook for a family of eight mm -hmm. um she didn't, they didn't have a lot of money and so the cuts of pork that she would use would be the cuts of pork that the butcher probably didn't want and i actually like talked to my friend I was like 
it's the rib. It's the back part of the rib. So <laughs> tight here, so I'll actually show you. But um, she would take the worst cuts of meat and make the most delicious dishes because I think this is the most delicious um, soup. It's actually really hard to get in a Chinese restaurant because people think of it as being too humble. I see. Uh, I could tell. Like, it's just not special, but I think it's so, uh, it's so simple. It's so healthy. And it's very chic now to eat um, bone broth. So it's like mm -hmm. a bone broth that's actually incredibly clear because I spent the labor of, you know, taking off the foam. And I'm going to finish it. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to finish it with cilantro and these red um, turnips that I got at the farmer's market. Now, what people usually use in when they're cooking, making this dish that um, what my grandmother used was um, daikon. Do you know what that is? The big Chinese turnips? Well, well, All right. Okay. Now I know. I understand. I didn't know how they were called. Yeah. So you, you, if I were in Irvine, I would go to Ranch 99 and get daikon. And I was here in um, Palm Springs without a lot of Chinese restaurants nearby, some Chinese grocery nearby. So I went to the farmer's market and I got this incredibly beautiful turnip, right? That is the Japanese radish, the red radish. Right. And um, I didn't want to make the soup all pink today. So I cooked the radish separately. But normally when you make this dish, about 10 minutes before it finishes, you put the radish, you put the um, daikon in. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to put this in now. I cooked this already separately and um, it's going to make my soup kind of pink, which is unusual. But here's the other thing about Chinese cooking is it's always great. It's always really good about for innovation. And it's always about like making do with what you have. And in this um, anthropological way, you know, Greek lodge is really big, like improvising, figuring out what you can make with what you can, with what you have. And, you know, also making things from poor cuts of meat, making these as delicious as possible. So within um, Chinese cooking, there's a lot of room for improvisation if you know what the tastes are. You know, That's if great. you know what taste you want to achieve. I don't know if that's the case in other cuisines. Certainly in Italian cuisine, it's like that. It's very open to improvisation. It's open. Yeah. And it, many recipes that are quite delicious are made out of the, you know, maybe the, okay. not the best cuts of meat or uh, uh, some dishes are very, had a very poor origin and, um, but still, they are delicious. <laughs> They're delicious, right? So, I think all like peasant cooking is like yeah. that. And if you really know what a peasant cuisine is, I'm not saying like make up anything and just do crazy stuff. You really have to know what the tastes are and then you can improvise from that um, area. That's why I feel like a lot of cooking shows, they fetishize like having all the perfect right ingredients and being, you know, um, being um, super prepared or being Martha Stewart-esque, I think that takes us away from the traditions of cooking that have to do with our grandmother's kitchens or our childhood tastes and smells that we can recreate. Maybe um, people who um, want to have cooking as a te specialized technique would find this way of cooking, you know, not good, but I find that it's like the most profound exploration of memory for me. I do agree. Completely with you. I always say when I demo a dish that uh, it's not a fixed protocol. So it's not that nothing can be changed because there are so many um, external constraints, right? Depends where you're cooking, the kind of products that you can get, but also the kind of temperature, humidity in the air. It's very different to cook in Palm Springs or in Palm Desert, um, which is near Palm Springs or and Irvine. The humidity in the air is completely different. Okay. And okay. so there are a lot of other of factors that uh, one needs to take into account. So I always say that's more like knowing how to do things and then changing according to the context and the necessity of the moment. Yeah, and it's uh, just I'm glad that we agree. <laughs> Yeah, it is this beautiful kind of um, creativity that you can find with the understanding of the ingredients that you encounter. Um, if you have that like basic 
understanding what a dish should be. And like I went to the farmer's market and I found these beautiful Japanese radishes. And I know that radish and turnip and the Chinese turnip or daikon are very close in taste. So when I saw them, I was like, okay, I, I need to have them because I'm going to integrate them into this dish. You know, whether it's the same for you, but for me, for my husband, um, that has always been outside Italy for the best part of his life, it's always been, a, cooking has always been based on memory and then on adapting that to the, whatever was available in a different country. Or there might not be the ingredients that we would have <clears throat> used if in Italy, right? And right. I guess that for you, it's the same. You, you are basing your uh, recipes on memory and then adjusting to what you can find around you. Right. And it, it says something about being, in some sense, an immigrant, even if certainly you, have you, are, you are not by now. <laughs> so right. The, the origins, right. the cultural origins. That's absolutely right. And um, the thing about my grandmother was she was an immigrant or an exile herself because she was from Northwestern China, which is Xi'an. Mm -hmm. And she went with the nationalist troops to Taiwan. So she had to adapt her very Northern Chinese ways of cooking to a tropical island. Mm -hmm. And um, she had to adapt to cooking for a family of eight. And she was the youngest daughter in a family where she would felt very taken care of all the time. So I think she was learning how to cook for her family as she was having her family, you know, having her children. So um, I, I always really liked that aspect of her approach to things, but she was, all, she was very nostalgic for Northwestern China. So now I'm very nostalgic for her version of Chinese cooking from Northwestern China in Taiwan. Actually, you know what, I've been in Xi'an in 2007 oh, wow. and so I had very fond memories because we ended up there in the middle of the summer when there was a, a, a local festivity, I don't remember exactly what, and there were people dancing on the streets so we were mingling <laughs> and dancing with them. Oh wow. <laughs> oh, wow. And uh, it's been... Uh, so that's a real my... Chinese flavor, people dancing in the street, that's yeah. really cool. <laughs> So um, I'm going to finish this. Um, I'm going to finish the soup like this. Oh, here's what the other thing is that I made it sound like so simple. I just put the spare ribs in. I just slow cooked it. Um, I took off the um, foam. But the other thing I did was um, I salted it to taste. So if you ask me like, hey, Catherine, how much salt did you put in there? Mm, I probably wouldn't be able to tell you. Like I find it very American to be like, I put two teaspoons of salt in here. <laughs> I don't know how much salt I put in here. Um, I, here's my, here's my salt taker. I just salted it. I tasted it. I cooked, I cooked, I salted again. Finally, I achieved the right level. And I don't know how much salt I put in, so sorry again. <laughs> Well, people that will was, have to figure it out according to their taste. I, I did slice um, four slices of fresh ginger in here. I, I don't recommend anyone eating that ginger, you know, take it out. But what I would do, what I will do is I'll serve it and I'll show you like, um, so there's the fresh ginger. Let me take that out. We're not going to use that. And then... I'm going to show you how, well, now because of the red um, turnips, it has a red tint to the soup. But the, what I really wanted to um, show was how clear the broth is because I took off that um, foam on top. And I, I've seen, I think like all that fancy um, um, cooking that people do with foam, that El mm -hmm. Bulli does, for instance, I feel like it was, must have been all inspired by watching our grandmother's mothers take off foam from meat stock. Yes. Because that foam is so delicate. And so, and then you want, you throw it away normally or give it to your dogs. But I feel like all those fancy chefs that cook with foam, they must have had grandmothers who also just spent a lot of time taking foam off the top to achieve this real, this level of clarity. And then what I'm going to do is, um, 
I have fresh cilantro and I'm going to put cilantro on here and um, I'm going to add a little more of the clear broth and there you have it. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. I can almost smell it. You know, yeah, I can I'm going to taste it. Of it. <laughs> Imagine the smell of it. <laughs> Um, I'm gonna taste it for you to tell you how. Um, it, oh, it turned out really nicely. I would say I need a little more salt. Mm -hmm. So I still have a pot. Got my salt in here. <laughs> here we go. Um, what I was saying, I, I just salt to taste. And what I was saying to um, my friend as I was cooking this is, I really think it's important to get the salt levels right because um, it's not customary in Chinese cuisine, in Chinese cooking, or to have like salt at the table for ah, soup. If you have to put salt on your soup, it means you're cooked mess up. That's an interesting tradition. I mean, um, you know, it's not in other uh, cultural traditions, it's perfectly fine to add salt at the table, but I can see why the rationale behind this way of thinking. It's great. Great to know. Thank you so much it's for great. this. Wonderful. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. So now um, we're gonna, we're ready to eat here. And if anyone has any questions or anything about these recipes, they know where to find me. I'm at UCI. But um, thank you for having me on. It's been this lovely to have you. I, you know, I wish I could be there with you <laughs> to taste these wonderful no. dishes. They, they, the, the aroma, the smell, the, the uh, the texture of everything and also uh, the, it, it's really comforting and uh, we all need a little bit of comfort right now. Me too. And I promise you that when we um, all can eat it together again, I'll make this dish for you in real life because the best part of making it is actually sharing it. That's because right. as you can see, it's a very big pot. It's not the kind of food you make for one person. Absolutely. So, uh, so long, and thank you again, Catherine, for being with us, and goodbye, everyone. All right. Thank you so much, Annalisa. Take care.